Carl, thank you. And I bring some good news. Uh, we just got word that this convention is, in all probability, the largest gathering of architects in the history of the United States of America. We have 26,000 people who are gathered in New York. And I hope you're enjoying it as much as I am. Welcome, welcome. This is day two of A18, the AIA's Conference on Architecture. Isn't it great, great to be here in New York? Are you loving it? I hope you are. And actually, this city is always one of the places that I call my own home. Now, it, it may not sound like, I mean, I've got a bit of a southern accent, uh, but I am a New Yorker through and through. For more than 50 years, I've made this city's turf my own. I came here first by train when I was 12 years old, and Penn Station was still this magnificent structure above the ground over near 34th Street. I, when I was a kid, I stepped out on the street, and this city was alive. I was awestruck. Steam was rising up out of the grates. The subway was rumbling beneath my feet, and the air was just thick with the smell of onion bagels. And th those bagels, the same bagels, are still outside there today. You just walk out the door, and you can, you can find them. New York had it all back then. Park Avenue and the High Life, 42nd Street and the Low Life, and it had everything in between. A few years later, I returned in the mid-60s for the World's Fair. And when I arrived at that exposition, it was held out in Queens. It felt like walking onto an episode of the Jetsons. Many of the pavilions were built in that circa 1950s futurist architectural style. And a couple of them are still out there, Philip Johnson, Wallace Harrington, Wallace Harrison. But the biggest attraction at the fair for me was a hometown girl I met from Brooklyn. I returned a second time in 1967, and I was in college. This time I was here to live, though. I worked just a few blocks from here, right over there in the garment district. I lived away from New York during the 70s and 80s, but I returned with a vengeance in 1996. And this time, uh, that young woman had become my wife, Holly. She's over here somewhere, and that was the young lady that I had gone to the World's Fair with. We returned with our youngest son and lived in Brooklyn, over on Hicks Street, just a couple of blocks from the river. I worked at that point in Rockefeller Center, a block and a half from here. But folks, I could not afford to live here in that location today. On this 15-year tour, I became a certified New Yorker. And today, I love this city as much as I ever did. I love its architecture. I love its vibrancy, its capacity for regeneration, for reinvention, and above all, this city's resilience. It's amazing. It thrives right in the moment yet it has one eye fixed out on the future, always. Yesterday, Carl Elefante told you all about what's next for this city and for the rest of the country. I, I want to talk about now, about the present. We all face the pressure to make payroll two weeks from today and pay office rents and manage pipelines of talent and recruit and develop that talent. In short, we together have to create workplace cultures that walk a tightrope, that straddle right between what's now and what will be next. That's hard. We all know, thank goodness, that this economy is white hot. Things haven't been this good economically since before the economic storms of a decade ago. Advances in technology are allowing us to design differently, better, faster, smarter, safer. We're all getting better at capturing more and better data about our buildings and their efficiencies. Today, we collectively can quantify, codify, certify our impact as we never could before. This is good. At the same time, we haven't forgotten that architecture is visceral, deeply visceral. 
Yesterday, Sarah Williams Goldhagen talked about that. Buildings and public spaces affect the way people feel down here, which is why now, more than ever, we're incorporating a centuries-old concept into much of our work. Empathy. What does the other person feel? What do they think? What do they need? We've got more progress to report. A new kind of firm is emerging. It's one built on inclusion and collaboration. You might call it a purpose-driven firm. Firms like that put social values first instead of a relentless focus on doing well. The purpose-driven firm reverses the normal order. Its goal is to do good, and that in turn can translate into doing well. If you want to see this idea and this model in action, just walk right over here to 34th Street again and a little bit over down to the High Line. That, I'm sure many of you have seen that already as you've been in New York, I hope you have. It transformed a decrepit elevated rail line into a lush urban ecosystem. Talk about doing good translating into doing well. The High Line today has ushered in literally billions of dollars of new architecture into the west side of Manhattan, and people come from all over the world to experience it. Still, we've got serious challenges. We're introducing our blueprint for better cities at a time of increasing social, political, and professional turmoil. Here's what I mean. The New York City that I discovered, that sort of rosy picture, uh, in the mid-60s was a mix of high, low, and everything in between. Increasingly, this city and others are a mix of high, higher, and stratospheric. In too many of our biggest, our best cities, middle-class people, ordinary people, are being priced out of the marketplace completely. And that's not healthy for here, and it's not healthy for cities in general. Here's another problem that we're all wrestling with. Talent. It's a conundrum. Simply stated, this industry does not have bench strength. When the economy crashed a decade ago, the music stopped for architecture. And when it did, many of the youngest members of our profession were left out and they moved on. Finding new, diverse talent needs to be our top priority. We need to build workplace cultures that are more inclusive for women and for people of color. Yes, we've made some progress, but our profession needs to mirror the society that we serve. So let's do it. Yes. Against this backdrop, the AIA your AIA is working to shape the future rather than be shaped by it. With Blueprint for Better Cities, we're more focused than ever on making cities more environmentally, socially, economically sustainable. We're using the strength of our numbers, and folks, we've got 92,000 plus members of this association now, highest in its history to advance this profession and increase our social impact. We can do it. We're advocating for the values that we represent, especially designing communities that accommodate people of all economic strata. Our outreach to our influence with Congress, with federal agencies, with governors, state legislators, mayors, civic leaders, has made a real difference. And I, too many of us don't know what's actually happened, even in the last year. We have made a difference in the livelihood of you, in architects, and more importantly, in the lives of the people that we work with. One example is, if you've been to your accountant, you've probably got more money back because of our work with the tax legislation. The omnibus spending bill that just passed is a great example. We lobby, we lobby, that's our job, hard to protect and even increase programs for key government uh, agencies, like the EPA's Energy Star program. Many of us use that program today. It calls for more sustainable, energy efficient, and resilient buildings and cities. 
the Community Development Block Grant Program. I'm sure many of you have heard of that. And the Low Income Housing Tax Credit. Both are pegged to creating affordable housing, one of those issues I just, that we just talked about. And folks, thanks to our efforts, funding for those programs that are vital to housing and cities grew by 12.5%. This in a difficult climate. So, we can make a difference. It increased. Here's another encouraging development. You, it's the emergence of what I could call the citizen architect, that's us. People who have a seat at the table whose opinions are solicited. So here's what I mean. Our country is obviously in a national debate over school safety. Very difficult topic. And while the debate rages on and on, architects are taking action. We are designing schools that are secure, that are safe, yet they're beautiful environments that encourage learning. That's what we do. The AIA offered to organize a series of roundtables on school safety next month. And guess what? The U.S. Department of Homeland Security accepted the offer. We not only offered space, but more importantly, we've offered our much needed input. Architects like you, designers, other experts in our profession will counsel the government on how to design safer schools. This would have been unthinkable 20 years ago. And there's more to come as we assert our influence and strengthen our lobbying and advocacy efforts. But we don't do that alone. This is the citizen architect. We do that together. So get out your phones and uh, follow me if you will. Get out your cell phone. And through AIA's new architect action alert, we can mobilize our collective power quickly to influence public policy as we've never done before. So right now in your cell phone, text AIA to the numbers that you're going to see on the screen right behind me, if you do that right now. This is among the easiest and most effective ways to stay informed, to take action, and make certain that our collective voice is heard. And that's at our federal, state, and local levels. All of you, each one of you, has the capacity to reshape our built environment. My confidence in this prediction is bolstered by all the lessons that the brightest people who are gathered together in this industry are sharing with each other this week. People who will send all of us home smarter, more inspired, more prepared to affect the change in the communities and the towns that we serve people just like the one you're going to hear next. And this is a special individual. Roy Spence is the co-founder and chairman of the advertising firm GSDNM in Austin, Texas, and of the Purpose Institute. He's a longtime friend of the AIA, and through his firm's work, he's elevated the visibility of this organization and of architects generally, and he's helped enhance our reputation. Roy is a longtime friend of mine, too. And his latest initiative is called the Promised Land Project. You'll hear about it. And it's focused on building a culture of us, not me, us. Its goal is to transform our nation into a more purpose-driven culture. So, ladies and gentlemen, Take out your hands, put them together, and welcome Roy Spence, please. <laughs> 